Um, and now it is time for our closing keynote. Um, um, Kirk Kaiser um, works at Datadog and has written a book called Make Art with Python. And he's going to be uh, giving us a talk about how to use code as a creative medium. And he'll be discussing various Python libraries which can help us to do that. Um, and Kirk, whenever you're ready. Hey, just one thing. I think whoever was sharing last needs to stop sharing. And hey, everybody, excited to be here. Kim, please unshare your screen. Uh, it's not a screen. That's the slideshow presentation. So you should be able to override okay. it. Cool. Yep. Here we go. Sorry, just got an error before. Hey, everybody. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about making art with Python. And just to be clear, I'm Kirk Kaiser. I'm an evangelism team lead over at Datadog. Um, and so I want to talk about computer science um, and what it's like to be somebody new coming into or being interested by computer science and why maybe we should think less in terms of computer science and maybe a bit more in terms of computer arts. Uh, the idea here is to make starting to write code less intimidating and seem less scary. About three years ago now, I took a course at a place in New York called GenSpace. Uh, so GenSpace is this incredible space where people can come and do genetic engineering um, within a hacker space. Uh, hypothetically, it sounds like the most terrible, dangerous, uh, bad idea ever to just have random people have a hacker space where they can go and do genetic engineering. Um, but in this case, GenSpace is run on a very uh, safe level with very uh, safe bacteria. And the idea of having a hackerspace where you can go and create new organisms just sounds so wildly cool to me. Um, so while I was there, I was chatting with a high school group. And so they were taking part in a competition called iGEM. It's the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. So these high schoolers were literally, literally creating a genetically engineered machine for class. And from my mind, I couldn't think of a cooler thing for teenagers to be involved in. And, you know, kind of as a software engineer and somebody who feels as if, you know, that's a cool thing too, I can relate to these kids. I went and I had a conversation with them and I asked them how they felt about software engineering in general. And their response kind of shook me. Um, their basic stance was that, you know, Computer science and computer engineering was the purvey of people who cared a lot about grades and people who were driven to succeed and didn't care about much else. Um, and, and so I kind of got the perception that, you know, computer science was just a class to, um, to get good grades on and to get ahead and to step forward. And that was kind of the exact opposite um, idea of computer science that got me into it. And so what I took away from that conversation with the, those kids was their perception of software development as an overachievers game. And so it, it seemed as if something that was, you know, a high barrier to entry. And if you didn't feel as if you were one of the smartest kids in the class, there was no point in trying and no point in throwing your hat in the ring. Um, and so that's to me like the worst possible thing and the worst possible brand perception for what I think is an incredibly important domain for us to be fo focused on. Um, and rather than viewing code as um, something intimidating for me personally, I've always viewed it as a medium to play with ideas and explore ideas. And so having that perception really impacted me and made me say, okay, I've got to start to shift this, this perception. And, and I've got to start to sell the idea that, that writing code really isn't about, you know, um, solving for a math problem. It isn't really about balancing a set of equations. Writing code is really about exploring and playing with ideas. Um, and, and I really want us to get to the point where we think of code as unintimidating as finger painting, 
where you can start to just put up a really gross piece of code that you don't have to feel bad about, you don't have to feel intimidated about, you don't have to feel guilty about, um, and you just start working with it and you just start building something from nothing. Um, and so in, in going through and in following that set of ideas, I started writing a book called Make Art with Python. And the, the idea here is we start with a, a pixel um, and we get a pixel on the screen and then we introduce for loops and we take a, a for loop to turn a pixel into a set of pixels that makes up a line. And then we start exploring based upon the, the fundamental building blocks and doing it visually. Um, and so the idea here is rather than starting with print statements, we start with a single dot on the screen uh, and explore uh, via visual medium. So one of the questions that's kind of can come up here is, you know, is, is writing code really an art? Um, or is it a computer science? Like it, when, when we study it in school, it has that name science at the end. Um, and so I think in order to answer that question, you've really got to take a step back and ask yourself, what is art anyways? And, and I think if we look at the history of the word, um, the history uh, comes from the root AR to put together. And in my career uh, writing software, I, I think a lot of what I'm doing is just plumbing. I, I'm, I'm just putting things together. I'm importing a library and I'm connecting it to another one. I'm taking some data, I'm doing a little bit of changing to it and then adapting it to another uh, out point. Um, and so another definition that kind of, as the word art was around for centuries, it evolved and the definition of it evolved. So the idea of uh, art as a skill or a result of learning or practice came a bit later. Um, and, and so when people speak of art, they have definitions for what is valuable to them. Um, and my personal definition of what is valuable to me and what I like in artists has always been a dedication to their craft. If I see somebody, and they could be doing literally anything, they could be putting sand in a row, they could be you know, doing dance, wh whatever it is, as long as somebody has put in the hours to get good at their craft, uh, it can be the most ridiculous and absurd thing in the world, and it can be art. Um, so this, this really starts to resonate with me and really starts to resonate with what it's like to be a, a practicing software engineer. Because with the science, when you say the word science, it sounds like something that has finite boundaries, right? It sounds like something that is potentially knowable. Here is the set of knowledge for software. And really, I don't think of writing software, building software, working on a team building software as a set of knowns. I think of writing software as an exploration of unknowns. Um, and so the language of, of what art meant um, kind of continued to evolve. And, and eventually by the 16th century, the idea of skill and cunning and trickery uh, came along. And one of the things that I find missing in most um, Western culture is the idea of using your intelligence to shape the world to better suit what you want it to be. Um, and so one of the book, books that blew my mind um, from a mythological perspective was The Odyssey. And I, I read it probably three years ago now. Um, but the idea here is Ulysses or Odysseus, the guy strapped to the post, he he finishes and he's successful in a, in a war and he's ready to go home to his family and he sails off and he's almost home and he gets blown off course and rather than making a triumphant return to his house he he ends up spending 10 years trying to get home and in those 10 years of trying to get home he uses his cleverness and he uses his you know positivity in general in a world that is seems to be rigged against him um to, to transform things and to transform situations. And in, in this photo here, what's happening is he strapped himself to the post. He's, he's going by an island where these, there are these sirens and you'll, you'll see they're presented as women who are flying eagles um, in this image. Um, so nobody has ever uh, gone close enough to the shore of this island to survive. 
every time they've gone by and they've heard these sirens sing, uh, people have crashed on shore or never been seen from again. Um, and so what he's done is he's put wax in all of his crew members' ears and strapped himself to the mast so he can perceive it. And so he can be the first person to survive hearing um, them sing their song. Um, and when I see this and when I, when I see all of the things Ulysses does um, in the Odyssey, I, I kind of, it resonates with me and it resonates with me as an approach to life in, in general of things might get bad, things might get difficult, how you interpret them and how you bring your, your cleverness and your intelligence to them and your positivity to them can shape things and can lead to uh, better outcomes in general. Uh, very minor side note, um, you know, the, the general stereotype here is that, you know, the beauty of the sirens is what makes everybody crash to shore. Um, apparently in one translation, what they're actually singing about is giving them the knowledge of everything. Um, and they're trying to share a bunch of knowledge with them. So very minor side note. And so strapping yourself to the mast and pouring ear, uh, pouring wax into the ear of your crew members so you can go um, hear these sirens that have been responsible for crashing everybody uh, in all of history. That for me is getting even closer to my idea uh, of art and even closer to what a term we have in computer science and in software development called hack. Um, and, and the idea with a hack is that it, it's a clever or elegant technical accomplishment. So it, it's, it's taking something and I think one of the key elements of a hack is constraints. Um, so you're either you either have a very small time crunch, you know, you have 30 minutes to implement this big idea, which I think we saw a lot of that in the lightning talks that just happened now, which were all great, great work, everybody. Um, and I think a lightning talk itself is that that same sort of thing, the same sort of hack. I mean, can you really explain an idea in two minutes, five minutes, three minutes? You can't. So you really have to compress and you really have to choose what to take out and what to leave in. Um, so I think hacks are the sort of thing that would get me interested in computer science as a younger person, as a new person. Um, and so here is one of the hacks that I did. This is uh, DAB and T-Pose control lights. Um, so if, for those of you who don't know, this is the T-Pose where you put your arm straight out and then the dab is this one, <laughs> which is a ridiculous dance move that is hopelessly um, uncool at this point. Um, and so building these kind of things is interesting to me. Um, but why? why? Why why take the time to kind of view art as a creative medium and kind of push art as a creative medium? Um, and why do the same with code? From my perspective, code and art are both rudders for the ship of human culture. Um, I, I think our responsibility it, to be so privileged as to build the worlds that other people inhabit, uh, you know, the virtual worlds that other people happen, the, the software other people use, we have to appreciate that level of responsibility because the world runs on software now. It, it's everywhere. There are there is a substantial portion of humanity who their workday is dictated by the algorithms we write. Um, they they're getting you know short term labor. They are um, you know interacting with software we build to do their jobs, um, to get their food, etc. Like logistics, every piece of humanity is getting touched by software. Um, and one of the things that really sh shook me. Um, early on in my career, I was working at an e-commerce store and we had something like 100,000 visitors a, a day. And each one of those vis visitors was spending an average of two minutes on the site, just browsing around. Um, and I, I, I was walking to the, to the, to the restroom and it, it just occurred to me two minutes times 100,000 people how much time people are spending within the software worlds we inhabit. And, you know, looking at a screen, you're looking literally at something somebody else built. And as a software developer, you're potentially building things um, that, that just 
have a wildly huge impact. You're, you're building entire worlds for other people to inhabit. And, and it seems dumb or it seems like maybe a bit of a stretch to say that, but really when we focus in on our screens or we focus in on a piece of software, an app, and we start scrolling, whatever it is, that becomes our immediate reality. There, there is nothing else other than the, the piece of software we're looking at. Um, so we are literally shaping the world that humanity is living within. And I think that that's something to appreciate. So um, what do we do about that? And kind of how can you build a career with creativity as a bit of a guiding uh, principle? Um, so daily sketches, uh, th this is something that I I've seen. So creative uh, fields in general, right? Um, a lot of, everybody wants to do creative fields. They they're very um, seductive. It, it seems like, you know, you get to make pretty things all day and you get to have a lot of respect and you get to have important things to say and you get to build beautiful things. Um, I know as a younger person, there was some creative fields I was really enamored with. Um, one was skateboarding. I, I, there was a point as a young person where that's all I wanted to do and I didn't want to hear anything else. Um, and the problem with wanting to do something creative is you need a set of boundaries. You, you need a space and a routine from within to work, from, from within you can work. Um, so you, you need walls and you need guiding rails. Uh, and one of the things that I learned later on in life is the power of doing something daily. And the idea here is a daily sketch. Um, so for 60 days, um, I, I, I did a thing where no matter what, I was gonna write and create a, a visual art piece um, and it could be the smallest, dumbest piece of code, but I would create something and I would do it every day for 60 days. Uh, and so out of that 60 day practice, you begin to have rails. You're given, again, as we said before, hacks generally have time constraints. Um, with, with given a full work day, a full life, family, kids, everything else, um, how can you squeeze in a tiny piece of art for yourself. Um, that is a strong time constraint, just like the lightning talk, um, just like we, when we said we we're doing hacks in general. Um, the idea of doing it iteratively and doing it daily means that it has to be small and it has to be tight and it has to be focused. Um, so here is a set of things. I don't know that it'll translate well with the, the video in general, um, but in my 60 days, I did a bunch of stuff. So on the left, there is um, face detection, and from that face detection, I'm creating points and using it to create South Park character faces. Um, that's using DLib, which is a great, um, really easy to use, pip installable um, computer vision library. Uh, the one in the center, I, I've used my face with a static image and just a rough outline. That's Python imaging library, um, Pygame, and DLib to detect the face features. And then on the right, I'm using something called uh, Mask RCNN. And so Mask RCNN can detect a, a bunch of different things. Um, part of the data set is skateboards and humans. Uh, so I alluded to it before that I, I really cared a lot about, and I still do, uh, skateboarding. And, and it was one of the main focuses in my life. Um, so it's extremely convenient for me that there is a, a computer vision library that can detect both humans and skateboards. And so that was a big piece of my 60 days of sketches. So again, not sure how it translates here. Um, on the left, we have um, a, a kickflip is what it's called in skateboarding and optical flow. I don't know the frame rate you'll get here, but there, there's wild colors. Um, the center, we have what's called slit scanning technique. Um, so I have a video and for each frame of the video, I'm gonna take one line of what is happening in, in that video and add it across an axis. So over time, we get to build the, the perceptual um, piece from either the center or from three specific pieces overlapping one another. Um, and then on the right, I used uh, mask RCNN and a recording of myself doing kickflip again. It's the theme in the slide. Um, 
And so there's the mask. And then I used it on a 3D printer to create kind of the flow of the kickflip itself and the outline over time. Um, and so I've, I've seen people take this idea on the, on the right with the 3D printed version, convert it to a circle um, of transparently printed filament and shine a light into it. So you can actually see the person doing the, th the thing or the animation happening. I, th I think they're called zoetropes. Um, so the very beginning of a zoetrope right there. So in doing all of these sketches and kind of developing this, this, um, this smaller practice, right? It's not, it's not serious. I, I, I didn't go to art school. I didn't, I don't have any formal qualifications and nobody said you're allowed to be creative now or you're not, you're not good. You're not bad. It's et cetera. Right? Like I just started, here's the thing I care about. Here's another thing I care about. I want to try to do this thing. Um, so after a while of doing these sketches, I, I hit upon this idea of uh, deep learning bird camera. Um, and so in my backyard at the time, I, I had a, a bird feeder and I got the idea from all of the computer vision stuff that was happening that I wanted to make a, a bird detection camera. Um, and so I wanted to detect when birds would land on my bird feeder um, and take photos and then potentially videos of them. Um, so this was one of the blog posts that came out of that. And um, I ended up getting videos from it and I ended up um, having a blog post get released that, that did pretty well. Um, it, it, it got a lot of page views. It was on the front page of a, a few sites and it led to me um, pitching my my bird camera to PyCon um, in the United States. And getting accepted at, at PyCon really changed my career for the better. Um, so doing something potentially insignificant, um, potentially not related to my job, uh, transformed my career and transformed it in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, because after getting accepted to speak at PyCon, I, I also got a, a new job uh, working at Datadog. Um, and, and so now my job is literally working to help make developers' lives better. And uh, bo both the company I work for is doing that and both the job role that I have. Um, so these daily sketches and the idea of you know, creative work in general led to kind of a complete shift in my career and kind of the peer group of people I had. And so it was really incredible to experience firsthand. And I, I, you know, having a job where you get to speak to developers is again, such a privilege, right? Developers are literally building the world that everybody inhabits and, and getting to help make their lives better helps improve so much of humanity, and it's just you know an incredible thing to be a part of. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of lofty ideas here, right? And then there's reality. Um, and you know, in hindsight, telling a story seems very clean and clear cut, and you know, you just do this, and you get this, and then everything goes well. Um, but how do we do it if we have a day job, right? And if we have a day job where it feels as if there's no room for creativity, right? Like I have had jobs where here's a set of tickets, here's a set of problems within the software, fix this set of tickets and move on to the next set. Um, here's our sprint, here's the set of problems, do it again. Um, and for me personally, um, I, I think there's, two things to recognize there um, because even just bringing that up, it, it reminds me of, you know, how draining that cycle felt to be uh, completely separated from the problem space I was working on, right? Rather than getting a say in the direction of the software I was building, um, being dictated the problem set. And I think for me personally, that doesn't work and that doesn't fit the way I work best. I, I like to be given a problem 
be given a problem space, create a first thing and then iterate on it. And I, I like to do it with a great team. Um, but in general, Python, right? I think it's still the best medium for creating software, for exploring ideas. Um, and I'm going to give a couple uh, reasons why um, I, I still think it's it's the best for exploring ideas. Um, and, and I'm going to do that through uh, a couple of libraries I've used and what lessons I think I've taken away from them. Um, so the very first one, an obvious one, and kind of the stereotypical one, is uh, requests. So if you weren't using the other Python libraries before requests, you, you might not have the context for what was so radical about this um, and what was so radical about this API. So in general, um, and this is still true of a lot of languages, um, in general, if you want to get a website and you just want stuff back out, it, it's three lines, right? You import it, you do a request.get, and then you, you do whatever you need to do on what you get back. In general, a lot of languages have kind of a, a lot of setup around building an HTTP request. So it might be 10, 15 lines, and a lot of the stuff you might not normally need to change. And so with requests, there was kind of this, this shift for me personally that you don't need to expose everything in an API. You can hide everything except for the most critical thing. And by hiding everything, it's transformative. And your libraries and your software both become more aesthetically pleasing and they become tighter and clearer and easier to read. And I think that, you know, you know, potentially four lines to two lines, is that really that big of a deal? I think it is. And I think that that was the real lesson for me from requests is that the smallest differences can lead to much greater outcomes. And also that API should be fun, right? Like, this feels to me more like finger painting than computer science. This feels like, oh, I just do a request.get, and then what are the things in here? And I can play around with them. NumPy. Uh, so this is, this for me was, was a big, um, big, big shock for how great a, a library could be and how it could kind of break out of the cage of Python in general. Uh, so, so NumPy is a math library. Uh, if you're doing any sort of computer vision or machine learning, you probably will interact with NumPy. Um, and the idea with NumPy is, is this thing called vectorization. And to vastly oversimplify, vectorization allows us to get out of for loops and into concurrent um, operations. So concurrency, we've all seen concurrency. It's, it's, you know, it's in Python, it's there. For me, whenever I've tried to do anything concurrent, it is complicated and it is tricky and you really have to think it through. NumPy, it got rid of all that stuff. Um, and gave you a language that feels Pythonic, um, but at the same time giving you access to a vastly faster computational model. And so th there's a couple lessons there. Um, one of the things I've heard before is, you know, Python is slow. Um, Python isn't as good as another language because everything is much slower in Python because there's the global interpreter lock and yada, yada, yada. Um, the idea that you can escape out of the existing method of execution and into another one entirely uh, it just is incredible. And I, I think the the API for it is a bit tricky at first um, and, and getting around to it. So in this case, what we're doing is um, we're creating an invisibility cloak, uh, which, which we'll see later. Um, and so the idea is we have an outline of a person and we're going to grab pixels to the right of them and put them on top of them. 
And so uh, we're doing an np.roll, which is going to roll the axes over um, in the shape of a mask. Uh, and, and that's what's happening. We're, we're pasting kind of pixels from the opposite side of a person into a person. Uh, you'll see the invisible book later. So uh, we can bend the computational model to fit in Python. That is the big idea here. Um, so NumPy, there, there's other libraries at this point that are moving um, computation to GPUs and giving us an API in Python. But the idea is the same here, that just because Python itself works on one computational model doesn't mean we can't take another one from somewhere else and put it on top. And so I think that, that was a, a great lesson for me in, in what to do. Music 21. Now, this one is not nearly as popular or famous as NumPy or requests. Um, but from my perspective, it should be. Um, and so one of the things I got into late in life is, is music. Um, as a young person, I'd always really cared and loved music. Um, it was... It was was and is and continues to be a huge part of my life. But I'd only ever experienced music as a consumer. And the problem with experiencing things as a consumer is that the only way you get to show how much you care or your opinions is by saying things you like and things you don't like. Uh, so you don't get to be a part of that conversation. Um, and so learning an instrument later in life uh, completely lit a light bulb for me. I, I, music had always been something you consumed and you pick, is this good, is this bad, is this great, is this amazing? Um, and so learning to play an instrument, it becomes, what do I have to say? What can I contribute back? What resonates with me and what could I play? What is the song I can play? Um, but coming into music from computers and, you know, pure rules and um, Boolean logic, um, you expect music to have a clear set of rules. And you expect music to have a structure to it um, at its very foundation. And as you get closer and look, you realize that that really isn't the case. A lot of what we've chosen in Western music and popular music is pretty arbitrary. Um, as, as an example, um, we have the idea of the A note being at 440 hertz. Um, the idea of the A note um, being at 440 hertz is completely arbitrary. And I might be missing that. It might be the C note, actually, now that I'm saying it. Uh, but either way, the center of musical gravity is entirely arbitrary. And it's entirely made up. And it might be 440. It might be 432. It could be anything. Um, in addition to that, we have the idea of octaves. So an A and then an A a bit higher is, is the same thing, but it, it's an octave higher. So it sounds the same to our ear, um, but it's entirely higher. In between, or what are called the intervals, there's actually a lot of room for how to make up those in-betweens. Um, and a lot of our instruments, like the guitar, um, aren't necessarily in the perfect spot. They're actually in different intervals, in imperfect intervals. And so with Music 21, um, the, there is the ability to change the, the entire musical world uh, from a very fundamental level. So we mentioned before the center of the musical universe in Western music is 440 hertz. You can change that within Music 21, and you can experience music with a different center of the universe immediately, and you can play around with that. And what I'm calling out here is this Music 21.pitch.pitch. .pitch. .pitch. Um, so I am getting a raw frequency um, from, from the greater code that this is surrounding um, to do two things. I'm using it to establish a vocal range for a person. So you go as low as you can with your voice and then as high as you can with your voice. And you can see how many octaves you can sing with. Um, then, and then we also use that, that set of octaves to play Flappy Bird and to have your, your pitch 
determine where you go with, within Flappy Bird. Um, so kind of rambling here, kind of getting off a bit, but the idea here is you can make musical ideas from the most basic building blocks. And I think whenever I've gone down to the root of a problem and whenever I've gone past all of the um, built up stuff around it, uh, it's always been a worthwhile endeavor and I've always learned something new. Um, so having the ability to go down to the most basic building blocks is always going to give you something worthwhile. And I think Music 21 is a, an incredible library just because it gives you the basic tools of what music is and says, these are the assumptions that, that Western music is built on. Here's different types of music assumptions. Play with them. And, and I think playing within that space is incredible as somebody who observed music and then started to become a part of music. How do we get ideas? Um, and, and what is a process for, for getting ideas more generally? Um, I, I want to talk with about a story for how I got um, one of the ideas I really liked and another idea in my past that kind of led to another good outcome in general and led, led to joining a startup pretty early, very early. Um, and so there is this place in New York called the New York City Resistor. Uh, and so the New York City Resistor is uh, a hackerspace that's been around for a very long time. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of MakerBot, um, but a few people founded MakerBot out of here. Um, and, and so it just really has this long history of people hacking together and sharing ideas in an amazing space. Uh, so I got the idea that I wanted to do a uh, installation in the interactive show. Uh, and so over the course of you know a, a week or two, a couple of weeks, I, I don't remember it all at this point in time, I, I built a, um, a robotic bongos um, controllable by plants. So the plants have, plants in general, if, if you put a piece of copper foil in the soil and a wire, you can do capacitive sensing. So you can sense when somebody's hand comes close to a, a plant or touches it. Um, and so in this case, I, I set up a, a, a couple MIDI programs, a couple MIDI loops to play a couple sets of um, drum rhythms. And so depending on which plant you would touch, um, it would play a different set of MIDI things. And so it was, the plants became MIDI controllers to pick drum beats and drum rhythms and, and play them live. Um, and so this actually led to, this was one of the things that led to me getting hired as a um, first employee at, at, at a startup um, where, where we did, we, we worked building a, um, uh, a music video creation application. Uh, another idea and where this came from, um, I, I watched a YouTube video of somebody training himself to uh, basically sing loud enough to break uh, a wine glass. Um, and, and so in this case, I um, saw the video of somebody singing to break a wine glass and it, it took him months to, to be able to train himself to do it and was literally something he was spending hours on every day. And I said, all right, using um, Obvio, I'm pretty sure I can do this thing. And so the idea here is that first you flick the wine glass, um, and this is an application written in Pygame. Uh, first you flick the wine glass and you take a sample of what's called the resonant frequency. And so that's the sound that it makes. Um, and then you play it back at, at a volume and hypothetically, if you can get that volume large enough, you'll shatter the glass. Um, and, and so that's what happened here. And it took a couple iterations. My, my initial trial, I couldn't get the volume loud enough given the speakers I had laying around. So I got, I got a 100 watt amplifier and I'm wearing headphones. And, and another lesson here is if you, sometimes one of, some of the great things about art are just being willing to go to ridiculous ends to do something. Um, having a stupid idea and pursuing it all the way to the end is kind of what, what this is about. It, it, in my case, I, you know, I said, 
you know what? I'm not able to do it with the stuff I have. I don't care what I need to do. Yeah, so the straw. Okay, that's actually a really good point. So the straw, actually, if you see, it starts vibrating right before it breaks. And so the straw is, is a way you can tell if you've hit the proper resonant frequency. So you can do the same thing with the straw in your house right now if you have a, a wine glass. You can kind of go up in pitch until you get closer to it. And once it starts to vibrate, then you've got that resonant frequency. And so, yeah, the straw is a visual aid to be able to help you um, determine when you've hit that perfect pitch. And yeah, you'll see, I don't know, like frame rate wise, if you guys can tell, but at the very end there, it really starts to vibrate a lot and really starts to go out of control. Um, but, but being willing to say, you know what, it's not working with my speakers. I don't care. I'm going to get an amplifier. And I actually 3D printed a um, extension to focus the volume at the, um, the glass. Being willing to do like the absurd things and to follow and see through an idea is, is a critical part uh, of anything and recognizing the value in dumb ideas. Um, so finally, I, I want to talk about the audience um, in general, who, who you're building everything for. Um, one of the things that if you get anything away from this, I, wa I want you to take is respect the people you're building things for. Um, in a day job, you know, there are ups and downs. There, there are times where everything seems difficult and everything seems to have a bad set of incentives potentially. Um, but ultimately we are building worlds that other people live in. And um, it really is a privilege to be able to do that. So honor that privilege and um, understand, you know, some stuff will suck, some stuff will be terrible. Um, but as much as you can, try to have and be that positive impact on those worlds that get built and the, the worlds that people inhabit. Um, I keep saying we're privileged, but we really are privileged to be the, the people who are creating the current culture. And there, there might not be grandstanding things. We might not be able to completely rewrite the code that we work on, and we might not be able to change completely the, the approach that we're taking in our day jobs. Um, but we can do small things, and those small things add up over time. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing from my perspective is, you know, connecting ideas for them that haven't been connected yet. Um, grabbing other disciplines and taking them into the work we do um, is a very fruitful endeavor. Having interests outside of, you know, the, the narrow field of what you're doing starts to leak into what you are doing. And so you get ideas from music, you get ideas from computer vision, you get ideas from skateboarding, and you start to translate all of those personal ideas into the problems that you're solving. And it might be in tiny breadcrumbs, but pieces of that begin to shine through. Uh, and so I mentioned before kind of the invisibility cloak. I don't know if the frame rate's gonna come through here or not, but that NP dot roll that's taking the mask of me, um, and it's turning it into invisibility cloak by copying and pasting pixels from the other side there. Um, and most importantly, have fun. Um, I, it, it, sometimes it can be difficult, especially if you're in a business um, where you know things are difficult and there's legacy systems, um, but enjoy it. it. It is a fun ride. And, all of the stuff you've seen is, is open source. All the examples are open source and they're, they're all at my site, Make Art with Python. Um, they're all available free, open source. Go play with them, go hack on them. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Kirk, for all this really cool talk. Um, we're running a little bit over time, but I think we have time for up to three questions. So the first up to three people who can type a question right now will get their question read out. I think some typing is happening. Typing continues, although it may just be clapping.
there may not be questions or possibly people want to ask questions. Oh, here we go. Um, ah, we have a question from Adam. What is your speaker and microphone set up for this? Yeah, so I have a, I think I have another one over here. So I have a, um, a light, it's the Elgato key light and the Elgato key light is bouncing off my ceiling. Um, and then I also have a Logitech uh, 920 or it's a 1080p, I, I think it's like a 920 something. I should have another one over here somewhere. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah, this is this is the webcam I have, um, and that, that's it. Um, sometimes, if I'm doing talks, I will set up my wireless lav. Um, but getting microphone levels proper with a wireless lav is difficult, um, and you generally have to set up with somebody ahead of time. Cool. Um, Whitney is asking which Python computer vision libraries do you most enjoy. Yeah, so I didn't really touch upon that here, but generally speaking, what I do is I use um, FFmpeg, which is like a Swiss Army knife command line tool and isn't written in Python at all. Um, but I use FFmpeg to split up a video into a series of images. And so if it's a 60 frame per second uh, video and it's you know three seconds long, it'll be 60 images times three seconds um, images. And so what I'll do is I'll take and I'll do a for loop and I'll iterate over all of those images and I'll load them up using, depending on the thing, if I'm doing uh, facial features, Dlib is really easy. If I'm doing mask RCNN, there's a, a library that um, uses, depending on which uh, deep learning framework you have, um, has different implementations. So I'll use that. Um, and yeah, OpenCV is also good. Uh, it really depends on the context, but that is generally speaking. And then once I've got all those images changed, I throw them back into FFmpeg and convert it into a video game. Cool. Um, there's a question about the specific lips, but I think those are going to appear in the video later. So last question from Gordon Ings. Uh, thank you for your talk. Do you have a strong feeling on computer science as art versus engineering versus, I don't know, real science? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things I learned in um, hanging out at that, that biohacker space is that there, from my perspective, there's a learning problem and there's a teaching problem, um, at, at least in American schooling systems. Um, and I don't know if it's universal or not. Uh, so the way that it's taught is that there's, there's this thing kind of built up as a young person where there's the split of smart kids who get it and dumb kids. And that's literally how they refer to each other is smart kids and dumb kids. And I think the perception is if you can do good at tests, then you are good and you can continue to excel and you can continue to break from the pack. And it's a very competitive sort of thing. Um, and working at GenSpace and meeting other real scientists, I, I think it became more apparent that anybody who excels at the chosen domain is an artist and is less somebody who is applying pre-written algorithms, right? It is an exploration of a space and it is a combining and a mixing of ideas. So anyone who does excellent work in any field, whatever it is, there is, yes, like the fundamental rules and the fundamental math and the fundamental logic and the fundamental um, units that you work with. However, taking those fundamental units and bending them is, is artistry. And I find it in every discipline where somebody is a master or is good at what they do, they're, they're always bringing um, cross-domain ideas in general, which is closer to art in my perspective. Cool, and we're going to cheat and sneak in one absolutely last final question from uh, John T. Pressinger. Did you make any tweaks or is that the default mask RCNN? I'm surprised it's so temporarily smooth. Yep, um, so that that is the default. Um, there are a couple tweaks you can make and yeah, computer vision has gotten incredibly good and scary good. There's, there's actually, the the library that I used for the bird camera is is called YOLO. You only look once, um, and it, it's very good at detecting where in a frame a thing is. And it it uses a data set called Cocos, and Cocos has like two hundred different subjects that it can recognize. Um, but the guy who created the algorithm has since quit computer vision entirely, um, just because he was concerned about the the, the moral imperative of tracking people and surveillance. Um, so yes, it's good and yes, it's getting better. Um, 
And yes, we are running into ethical um, conversations in general with like the leading, one of the leading computer vision researchers saying, I'm done, I'm not going to support this anymore and disappearing entirely, basically. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much again. I think that it is time for a round of applause. And now for the closing ceremony, I'm going to hand over to, I think, Whitney and Simon. Thank you very much.